it's time for another edition of the Daily Racing Form Weekend Preview. And this time we are going to head out west for some big racing at Santa Anita. It is opening weekend and Saturday is the new California Crown Day. David, this is a day that they've uh, created out west to try to compare to the Pegasus World Cup Day that they have over at Gulfstream Park down in January. And what they want to do with this day is not only have the incredible racing that we're used to and uh, quality racing product, but this is one of those on track experiences that you don't want to miss they're going to have live music tons of great food great drinks and it's going to be an incredible experience for everyone that's in the area so if you are in the southern california area and you want to have some fun this weekend on saturday you'll also get the chance to see me running around uh, taking video and uh, and doing some work there there's a huge handicapping tournament go to californiacrown.com that's the website you can get all the details check out tickets everything you need david but most importantly is the quality racing and we're going to talk about the grade one california crown that's going to go as race number nine and david it's not the biggest field in the world there's only going to be seven horses that were entered and it looks like only six will run we got some news earlier on friday that looks like the horse to the outside the number seven won't be entered but not the biggest field, but we still have five horses in here who are grade or group one winners. So a pretty strong group and at least a very top heavy group. Yeah, it's an important race on the calendar. We're just five weeks away from the Breeders' Cup, which is the championship series in horse racing. And the California Crown is the major prep race for those horses that are going to be pointing towards the Breeders' Cup based in California. No surprise when you've got a major grade one race in California, three Bob Baffert entrants in this race that he typically dominates the stakes racing out in California. He's got a strong hand in the stakes. We're going to look at the Timeform U.S. Pass performances, and these are a modern way to handicap the races. In fact, we've got one of the men who know Timeform U.S. Pass performances as well as anyone. They're visual, they're interactive, they illustrate how the race is projected to unfold. For all of you out there, all of you sports grid viewers, you can get a free race card with the code SGTF Sports Grid Timeform 24. SGTF 24. Visit drf.com slash sports grid to get your free card today. David, let's meet the field for the big one on Saturday. Race number nine at Santa Anita is the $1 million California crown. And uh, one of those Bob Baffert runners is from the inside. This is Newgate. He is a grade one winner. He won the Santa Anita handicap back in March. The problem with Newgate is he went to Dubai. He raced in one of the biggest races in the world in the Dubai World Cup. We just haven't seen him since then. So we have quite a layoff for him to deal with. But if you're watching his races in the morning or his uh, training in the morning, his workouts, he seems to be doing pretty well. He worked out with a horse named Prince of Monaco and kind of dusted that horse in his most recent one. So what are your thoughts on Newgate here, the first of three Bafferts that we'll meet? Yeah, those three Bob Baffert runners in this race, he's probably the one that has the most questions to answer coming off that long layoff, having not seen him since the end of March of this year, as you said, overseas in that Dubai World Cup. He did run very well to win that big cap at the beginning of March, grade one winner over the Santa Anita course. Now coming back, as you said, I like the visual of his workouts, dusted that horse, Prince of Monaco, and uh, just seems like horse is coming into the race doing well, but I think he's going to need his very best effort coming off the layoff to beat the rivals that he meets here right next door is Subsanador this one is an Argentinian bred uh he's kind of a fascinating horse David because following along and being out in Southern California I remember when he came and he had his first race on December 26th opening day of Santa Anita last year and he, he had a little bit of buzz coming into the race but he you could tell visually and in, 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 uh, listening to some of the connections talk he was just a little behind in his training he had some kind of hiccups and it took a few months after that race for him to really get some foundation. He came back in the big cap. He ran very well there. He almost won that day uh, just behind Newgate. And then he moved into the Richard Mandela barn, another very, very good trainer. And I felt like that race uh, at Monmouth Park, the Island, he really seemed like he got this horse figured out. You and I did a preview video for DRF YouTube that day. You picked this horse right on top. He looked really, really impressive. What do you think about his chances in here? Yeah, I think the mile and a quarter when he was beaten by Newgate in that Santa Anita handicap might have just been a little bit too far for him because it seemed like he had the race won and just gave it up at the very end of that race. Didn't love the trip that he got in the Gold Cup after that. And as you noted, he was very impressive last time out at Monmouth, going a mile and a 16th in the Islin, made a blitz around the far turn to take that race over. And it almost seemed like he was a little bit unprofessional through the stretch as he was pricking his ears and pulling himself up a little bit as the margin got a little closer coming to the wire. I think he's coming into this race in great form. We'll just see if he can overtake this three-headed monster from the Baffert stable. 
One of those uh, is coming up next. That's National Treasure. You may know this name. It sounds familiar. He won the Preakness back in 2023. And what's so cool about him, David, is we see what happens when horses can stay in training from three to four. This horse has just gotten a little bit better. Um, he's a multiple grade one winner this year. I've never been all that high on him, but when he gets the right type of trip, he's really good at a mile, up into about a mile and an eighth, and he's very tough to pass on the front end. So um, he's a horse that has a really high ceiling, and he probably probably will be the speedy of the three baths. Yeah, you could see in some of our Time Form US data there, he's got the highest speed figures in the race. He's the fastest horse early. He's projected to have a pace advantage, meaning that he's going to be up front, probably setting a pace that's comfortable for him. That So that makes a front runner like him especially dangerous. And he just really had a legitimate excuse last time in the Whitney when he didn't make the lead over Arthur's ride. I think his race was over pretty early that day. Um, he's going to get his preferred trip in here. And if he runs his best race, he's going to be awfully tough to catch in the street. One of the bigger long shots uh, in this field will be uh, Katana. And this is a horse, David, who is really, really honest, uh, a fun horse to own and to train, shows up and gives you a good account of himself each and every time. But I think we saw when he stepped up uh, in the Pacific Classic, uh, he may have a ceiling right now as far as a, a competition level, a class level. I just need to see him break through against a group like this in order to really kind of level him up against this type. How do you think he stacks up here? Yeah, I think the race you would point to that makes him somewhat competitive here is two back in the San Diego Stakes where he finished second to the very good Dr. Vankman, but there was a major no-show in that race, a heavy favorite for Bob Baffert that failed to run his best race that day. This horse was not particularly competitive in the Pacific Classic last time, and I personally think this is a tougher race than that one. Muth, grade one winner, is a three-year-old facing older for the first time. This is a really talented horse, David. He's had a couple hiccups throughout the year. He was initially supposed to run in the Preakness. Then they were pointing him maybe to the Pacific Classic. They picked out a softer spot for him, which is a nice way to prep a horse for a big effort. Because if you're going to be pointing to a big race, you don't necessarily want to have taxing race after taxing race leading into it. So Muth is a horse to me. Thinking about the trip that he may be able to get sitting just off of National Treasure, if, if that's how things go, uh, I feel like he has a really high ceiling and maybe we haven't really seen close to what he can do yet. Yeah, this horse has been highly regarded in the three-year-old division all year, and he's a little bit light on accomplishments at this point, given the way that he's been thought of and the fact that he actually beat the Kentucky Derby winner, Mystic Dan, in the Arkansas Derby, which was a prep for a lot of three-year-olds, not those in the Bob Baffert stable. He was not eligible to start in the Kentucky Derby this year, so that's why Muth didn't show up in that race, scratch from the Preakness. He's had some issues, but seemed like he got in a perfect prep race last time in that shared belief. I would expect him to move forward off that performance, given the work workouts that he's put in since that race he's never been the flashiest workhorse and it seems like he's doing better than ever in the morning's training for this race so i'm expecting a big effort from Muth. we know where senior buscador is going to be he's going to be towards the back of the pack he has no early speed but he will always come running late he just needs to get the right type of setup what a cool horse though when you look at what he's done in the last year or so from the breeders cup classic cigar mile the pegasus world cup the saudi cup the dubai world cup some of the biggest races in the world david and he got a nice prep in on August 24th they sprinted him just to maybe sharpen him up a little bit um, and maybe just get a little more positional speed out of this horse and set him up well for this race I just don't know in a small field like this if he'll get the trip he needs what do you think about Senor Buscador yeah, he's as talented as anyone in this field, but you see the difficulty captured in that Timeform U.S. pace projector up in the right-hand corner of the screen. Timeform U.S. predicting this is a race that will favor front runners. That just really works against a horse like Senor Buscador, who has no early speed whatsoever. Well, that rounds out our field, David. So now it's the important time. Let's take a look at selections for this race. Who are you going to put on top and how are you going to stack them in the California crown? I went for Muth in the California crown. I think it's going to turn into a match race between the two Bob Baffert stable mates, he and National Treasure. And I just like the way Muth is coming into this race. Yeah, I'm going to go with some Sanador on top. I think he has a little versatility to him. We know he can be forward, but I love seeing that he can sit off horses. He can pass horses late. So I hope he's forward and uh, he'll have a little bit of punch late. And Mandela has him figured out. So that is the biggest race on the card Saturday at Santa Anita. But there are some other big ones with huge purses that have been bumped up. We're we're going to talk about a few of those next in our pick five sequence. Don't go anywhere.
Well, on a big Saturday at Santa Anita, David, they've given us even more wagering opportunities. And one thing we love as a better, we want to have more of our money coming back to us. So these wagers uh, that we're going to be talking about, the all stakes pick five, and then a lot of specific wagers you can find at CaliforniaCrown.com. Those wagers are all 15% takeout, which we love. In horse racing, we're kind of in the 10% to 25-ish percent. So uh, anything that can be lower is better for us. Remember, these pick fives, they're kind of like a parlay for those those of you who are sports bettors, we have to have the winner of all of these five legs of the sequence, and they're all going to be really big races this weekend. And one of them is that California crown that we just discussed. So, David, let's go through the uh, the races that make up this pick five. It actually starts in race five at Santa Anita, and then we'll go to races seven, eight, nine, and ten. They're all five of the stakes races on Saturday. And the first one will be the unzip me. This is going to go as race number five. They'll be coming down the hill in here. I think from a conversation standpoint, Toopy, probably the horse to beat. You and I, when we put this pick five ticket together, we're going to end up using four horses. Uh, the one, 10, 11, and 13. Why don't you talk uh, about some of the horses you like in there and who you think will be uh, able to have a strong opportunity in this race? Yeah, we want to spread out a little bit in this race because it does feel like one of the more competitive races in this sequence. And I agree, Tupi is the horse to beat. She's got nothing but consistent, strong form in these turf sprints, but she's never raced in California or on this unique downhill course. So I think there are some question marks there. I'm especially interested in a long shot in this race, the number 13, Wrigleyville. She is an East Coast runner that I'm pretty familiar with having raced in Saratoga. And uh, she had a trip last time, meaning that she was cut off in the stretch by another runner rival and her jockey had to check up on her and lose momentum coming to the finish line. That's a race that she would have been right there at the finish without that trouble. And I'm kind of interested in her turning back to more of a sprint distance, but there are some others drawn down towards the inside who have a little more speed, like the number one Dreamfire, who I know you have some interest in. Yeah, there's not that much early speed in this race too. So that's why I think a horse like Dreamfire, if they can catch a flyer and get out front, could go a long way, even coming off that long layoff. Uh, and another one in here, I think who could be sitting close that we'll throw in is the 10 Golden Canary has a little versatility can sit close but can also pass horses has some really good races up at woodbine so 1 10 11 and 13 david and i will try to use uh, we'll use four horses to try to get out of that first leg of the sequence we'll skip the sixth race that is not a stakes race and for this sequence we move to race number seven race number seven david is the john henry uh this is one of those races that the purses got boosted way up to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. it is a grade two we have six horses that all came back from the Del Mar handicap. I'll mention a horse that I like a little bit in here. Uh, I thought the three Devon Propo was interesting. Just an up and coming horse who continues to step forward. I thought all three of the races in the U S are visually impressive and a horse who can sit a nice trip. So the three will be one of the horses that we include, but uh, a couple others that we have on the ticket are masterpiece and gold Phoenix. Why don't you tell the folks a little bit about them? Yeah, I think this is the toughest race to get through in the sequence because it's so contentious, but you have to narrow it down somewhere. And the two horses that I wanted coming out of that Del Mar handicap were Masterpiece, who I think is going to be the better price, the number four. He just got a trip that day that I didn't think was ideal for him. He was pressing the pace up towards the front end. I think he does better when he can slot in behind horses and make one late rally in the stretch, and he should get a better chance to do that going the mile and a quarter distance here. And then the number nine, Gold Phoenix, the likely favorite in this race. He is just the horse to be coming off a victory in that Del Mar handicap where he beat five other rivals that he's facing in here. He's so consistent, runs well in Santa Anita. He seems like uh, the one that's going to be there all have to get around. The eighth race, that's the third leg, the middle part of this pick five sequence. That is the grade two California crown Eddie D. That's one of the three races that got the purses boosted up to $750,000. They'll run down that six and a half furlong unique turf course at Santa Anita. We'll end up using three horses in here, David. Uh, the two horses down on the inside are horses that have sort of different running styles, but they both fit pretty well. We're going to use both Johnny Padres and first piece on the tickets. Yeah, first piece is a horse that I'm pretty interested in because he has had so much success on this unique downhill course at Santa Anita, and they tried to go longer distances with him a couple times recently at Del Mar. The trips just didn't quite work out, especially last time when he was just wide around the turns. That's not a trip that you want to get at Del Mar. So I think getting back on his preferred course is going to make him tough. Johnny Padres, he just comes flying at the end of his races. He is the strongest finisher in this race. So he's one that I think is going to run well if any speed develops develops towards the front end. And then uh, another horse that I think will be more forwardly placed is the number six, Air Force Red. And his the key to success with him is having nobody else press him on the front end. We'll see who else wants to go towards the lead here. 
Yeah, and, and when they go six and a half, he's able to just kind of let loose, not really worry about the fitness edge because going a mile sometimes it's a little too far for him, but the downhill layout is really nice for Air Force Red. It's one of these courses where if you have experience and you run well over it, usually you continue to run well over it. So that's going to go as race number eight. We move to the ninth race. This is the one that we just discussed a moment ago. So to recap for everyone, David, we will use the two Substantador, the three National Treasure, and the five. I feel like we have the three horses to beat in that race pretty well covered. Probably the top two betting choices for Baffert and then Substantador. So uh, we have half the field in there. But the key for us, how we've built our ticket, is all going to lead into the final race. Because in race number 10, we're going to see a really talented horse named Johannes who is going to be in the City of Hope mile. And I got to give a little shout out to City of Hope. I'm a cancer survivor. Uh, City of Hope saved my life in Duarte, California. So anytime I see them uh, in the running lines, I got to give them a shout out because without City of Hope, I'm not sitting here right now. But David, you and I are going to try to close out this pick five with a single of Johannes, who is six for seven on the turf. And a horse who has, as he's gotten a little bit older, he's actually shown some versatility. Used to be a horse who wanted to be kind of just on the front end. Now he can sit and he just seems like a really nice horse that might be a cut above the rest of this group. Yeah, this is a talented group of runners, but it does feel like Johannes is the best horse in this West Coast turf division right now. He's coming off a victory in the Eddie Reed, where he beat some horses that we're going to see actually in an earlier race. And he won that race very convincingly. He has a grade one victory over this one mile distance at Santa Anita. He's only lost once on the turf. That was the one time they shipped him to Kentucky and he had a pretty tough trip that day. But he's on his home track here and he looks like he's going to be pretty tough for this field to beat. Yeah, he's a grade one winner. He is the horse to beat. If you're looking to go uh, in other directions, uh, DeJour is a horse who has good success there recently. Uh, Tricari is a horse who's coming in from the East Coast. Kind of interesting. Maybe to the outside, you know, Almondari sort of conclude. They fit at the level, but I just think Johannes and, and David agreed that Johannes feels like a, a cut above the rest of the group. So here's how we've mapped out the ticket. And remember, this is a $1 base ticket. So uh, it is a little more difficult. You, when you have a 50 cent base, uh, you can spread out a little bit more. You can use a few extra horses. Here, we had to take a stand in, in a couple races and uh, we'll have our major single coming in race number 10 to close things out. Uh, as we get set for our final commercial break, we want to remind all of you watching out there that you can get a free race card these Timeform U.S. past performances when you go to drf.com slash sportsgrid. Get your free card today and use the promo code SGTF24. Well, for our final segment, we will head out to the East Coast across the country and we'll take a look at four stakes races out at Belmont at Aqueduct. David, right now, the timing of the racing season is uh, important because a lot of horses are trying to get their final prep races in for the Breeders' Cup at the very beginning of November. And I think that's the case out at Belmont at the Big A. Uh, we'll start in race number four out there, which is the grade two Woodward. Not the biggest field in the world, just a field of four that will end up running. But you can make a case for the four runners in there. Skippy Longstocking is the horse they'll all have to beat, though. You have him as four to five on the morning line there, and he's definitely accomplished. And I think he's still looking for his first grade one win, though, and it's kind of a, a good spot for him to get a grade two and then hopefully head into the Breeders' Cup looking for that big, big victory. He's been a like a model of consistency in the older horse division over the last couple of years. What do you think about Skippy Longstocking in the field in the Woodward? Yeah, he just figures to control this race on the front end. He has more early speed than his three rivals in this race, especially considering that the number 5K Army expected to scratch it here. He would have been an interesting runner coming in from Chile. Uh, for, but uh, Skippy Longstocking, with the way this race shapes up, he's going to be uh, in the driver's seat towards the lead. I do think that between the two Todd Pletcher challengers, Krupe and Tappet Trice, I think Tappet Trice might be an interesting possible upsetter in this race. He didn't run that well last time in the Jockey Club Gold Cup, but that's that was a pretty tough field, and I thought he ran very well off the layoff uh, two back in the Mammoth Cup. So if he can rebound to that kind of effort, he might be able to give Skippy Longstocking a challenge. Yeah, I think I feel very similar about this race. If you're maybe looking to bet it or if you're looking to find some value, if Tappet Trice offers you that, I thought he would be the one to maybe kind of 
grab onto because I was disappointed with his last effort, but he has a very high ceiling as we saw in his first start back uh, off the bench. So I think if he were able to show up with a big effort, uh, they could all be running for second here and he could get the better of Skippy Longstocking. Let's move to the second of the four stakes races on the Saturday card. David, we're going to go to race number six. Now this is the grade one Joe Hirsch turf classic for horses that are going a, a mile and a half on the turf course. The one to beat in here and a horse that we are all familiar with is warlike goddess. She's a seven-year-old mare and she has won this race a couple of times she is a 10-time graded stakes winner yeah warlike goddess is one of the coolest horses that's racing right now a seven-year-old mare so she is a female taking on the male horses in this joe hirsch turf classic but as you said she's won this race a couple of times already and she'll be trying to do something unprecedented on saturday winning this race for a third time in the storied uh, history of this race no horse has ever done that so more like god is trying to achieve something pretty cool i think she's the horse to beat but she's gonna have to face a tough rival in the number six silver knot who looked like he was ascending to be one of the top horses in this division earlier in the year comes off a disappointing effort in the sword dancer last time but i didn't love the tactics that his connections employed that day so i think he's going to get a more aggressive ride this time and he looks like the main rival for warlike goddess to me and one of the main concerns with her is just she's not fast early. She's a horse who has a really big late turn of foot, but she's not a horse that can always work out her own trip. So she is sometimes at the mercy of racing luck, whereas a horse like Silver Knot, who you mentioned, that's a horse who has some speed, who can sit off horses, and he's going to be much more forwardly placed in this race than Warlike God is. So that's a look at race number six. Let's jump into race number nine. This one's interesting, David. This is the Vosburg. So this is a one of the top races for sprinters, uh, but it doesn't really have any overwhelmingly uh, accomplished sprinters at this point. I mean, you look at a horse like Comedy Town, who has won back-to-back -back races, but is going to step up in class. This is a grade three race, so he'll face graded stakes company here. Uh, a horse who scratched out of a spot at Churchill. You and I actually talked about a race that he um, was removed from is Mufasa, and I think he's kind of an interesting horse who did a lot of really good work in Chile earlier on in his career. What are some of your thoughts on the Vosburg? Yeah, based on the reporting of our Daily Racing Forum colleague, Dave Grenning, it sounds like Comedy Town might scratch from this race waiting for Keeneland. And I, that, I think, makes Mufasa the horse to beat coming off a visually impressive win at Colonial Downs last time, stepping up against the tougher field here, uh, but he might be up to the challenge. I'm a little interested in the number four, Dean Delivers, who has a lot of early speed. He's won four races and sw switching into the Ned Allard barn, and he's stepping up in class two, but I think his speed could make him dangerous in this Vosburg. And fans of the Mandalorian will be out in full force with Baby Yoda, also a, a popular horse, the, the number three in that one. Uh, let's get to the final of the stakes races on Saturday at Belmont at the Big A. It is race number 11. It's the Pilgrim. These are fun races, David, because you have young horses, two-year-olds going long on the turf. So for people like you and I who like to watch race replays, you can find lots of fun trips. You can see some impressive horses in here. Uh, who are some that you are going to lean on in the 11th race? Yeah, there are a lot that you can make a case for in here. I'm pretty interested in the number six, Smooth Breeze, who is going to be a price in this race, a New York bred, who is facing off against open companies or horses that were bred anywhere heading into this pilgrim. But I really liked the visual impression that he left with me at Saratoga when he won his first start. It just seemed like he was figuring things out in that debut race. And I think with a more professional effort and showing a little more speed in this pilgrim on Saturday, he could have success at a pretty generous price. Zulu Kingdom looks like the one to beat. Maybe give a look to Concord Green, who was very impressive in the debut. David, covered a lot of ground from coast to coast this week. Thank you so much for helping us out. And don't forget, for all of you out there watching, take a look at the exclusive promo code that we have just for you, you Sports Grid viewers, and those Timeform US Pass performances.